Section 11 of Wellington by George Hooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 8 Wellington's Offensive Campaigns, Part 1. The time was now near when it would be possible and profitable to assume the offensive and strike directly at the French in Leon and Castile. Portugal had been secured by the craft and daring which wrested the two frontier fortresses from the enemy. The next thing was to break the direct line of communication between Seville and Madrid, and that was accomplished when Hill, the best of all his lieutenants, victoriously surprised the French at Almaraz, broke the bridge, destroyed the works on the right bank and blockaded the fort on the Mirabete on the left, which an irresolute officer failed to seize. The French having been deprived of Almaraz by Wellington's direction, the engineer Sturgeon repaired the bridge at Alcantara, and thus a shorter line of communication was established between the British forces on the Agueda and those in Estremadura. At the same time, the navigation of the Doru and Tagus was improved to facilitate the transport of supplies, and finding that both marshals expected to be attacked, Wellington did all he could to confirm each in his opinion. The consequence was that no plan of concerted operations against him could be formed, and from his own sources of intelligence and their intercepted letters he was acquainted with the dissensions raging in the hostile camps. King Joseph, who had been made commander-in-chief, was unable to exact obedience from his captains, and thus the British general, who was bent on an offensive movement, enjoyed the advantage which it confers on one acting against perplexed and jealous adversaries. By patience and sound judgment at all times, by a wise audacity at the right moment, he had obtained a military as well as a moral ascendancy, and was about to reap the harvest which his long suffering, his ceaseless labours, and his genius as a soldier and statesman had sown and nurtured in an ungrateful soil. When Napoleon, on June thirteenth, at the head of the Grand Army, was advancing on the Niemen, the little Anglo-Portuguese host, so long held at bay, sprang joyfully over the Agueda and marched toward Salamanca. Four days afterwards they were over the fords of the Tormes, and while one division invested the fortified convents, Wellington faced Marmont from the heights of San Cristobal. The French marshal advanced to relieve the forts which were now enduring a siege, and he had a fair chance, for the means, as usual, were insufficient, although on this occasion the error in judgment was caused by the imperfect report of spies. Hence the guns were too few or unsuitable, the bright moon hindered the working parties, and the engineers were still engaged in their task, when Marmont hastened over the plain with twenty-five thousand men. Then, while the forts were battered day after day, the two main armies maneuvered and wrestled on the hills and on both sides of the Tormes. Neither would take the initiative in a battle, Marmont because he could not get a chance which suited him, Wellington because he would not risk the success of his large plans, even when his rival furnished an opportunity. At one moment the siege operations were stayed for want of ammunition, but it was not until June twenty seventh, ten days after the investment, that the garrison was compelled to surrender. For some reason, either weakness in cavalry, or the knowledge that reinforcements from the north and centre would not arrive, Marmont, after the fall of the forts, retreated over the Doru. The mere incursion of Wellington had shaken the French defensive system, for Bonnet's fine division was drawn from the Asturias, which enabled the Galician troops to invest Astorga, and the partisans on the coast, aided by Admiral Popham's squadron, as far east as Bilbao, to resume their activity. The French held Toro, Tordesillas, and Tudela on the river, and Wellington following took post on the left bank, for his advance was arrested by the strength of the position, and his usual difficulties growing out of want of money were almost fatal. Bonnet there joined Marmont, and the latter thought that the time had come to retort upon his adversary. He resolved to cross the Doru, and his plans were so cleverly laid and neatly executed that he succeeded in gaining an initial advantage. For he marched two whole divisions to the left bank at Toro, and when attention had been drawn thither, he rapidly marched them back, 
and flung his whole army over the stream at Tordesillas. Wellington was not wholly surprised, but he was in peril. To meet an attack from Toro, he had collected his left and centre on the Guareña, but the right was still on the Trabancos under Sir Stapleton Cotton, and on July 18th was in the presence of the French army. He held his ground and imposed on the adversary for a few hours, but some French horse dashing over the stream and nearly capturing both Wellington and Beresford found that only a part of the army was in line. Thereupon Marmont, who was bold enough and apt in invention, sent his masses onwards toward the Guareña, bent on turning the British right, and the two armies marched for ten miles on an open plain in parallel lines. The French marshal hoped to reach the commanding tableland at Valesa, but he was forestalled by his alert antagonist and lost some men and a general in a combat near Castrillon. After a day's halt, the game of maneuvers was resumed by Marmont, who, moving swiftly up the Guareña, crossed it near its sources and fairly turned the right of the Allied position at Valesa. And then the two armies once more marched side by side, racing to gain positions near Salamanca. The French had the better, for although Wellington secured the hills in front of San Cristobal, Marmont planted his troops on the heights above the Tormes, which commanded the fort at Huerta, which gave him an access to the country on the left bank. So far the marshal had won the advantage in manoeuvring. In other respects the armies were fairly matched. The slight superiority in number was on the side of the Allies, who also had more cavalry, but the French were nearly as many, and they had more guns. Whether there would be a battle now depended upon Marmont, for Wellington would not fight unless his rival gave him a fair occasion. The Allies fell back to San Cristobal, and on the 21st, when Marmont, crossing the Tormes, took up a position at Calvarizza de Arriba, Wellington, leaving the 3rd Division to watch a French division established at Babi La Fuente, also planted his army on the same side of the river. He was still, while watching for a chance to fight, meditating a retreat, when the enemy on the 22nd furnished an occasion. The Allies were posted on a line at right angles to the Tormes, and the French, gathering over against them, began the fray by a contest for the commanding hills among which were the famous Arapiles, two isolated craggy heights near the British right. In the first rush, the French gained the outer and the British the inner hill, from which at first the leading companies were driven, but quickly recovering halfway down, and enraged at their mishap, they dashed forward and secured the summit. It was from this elevation that Wellington watched the movements of his opponent, who was opposite the British left. The French divisions coming out of the forest were seen to extend more and more to their own left, and the English line was changed until it was parallel to the Tormes. As there was no longer any need to guard the other bank, the third division was brought over and posted on the right, in the low ground about Aldea Tejara. The day advanced, yet there was no general action. Wellington went to sleep, desiring to be roused when the French left, then pointing towards the Rodrigo Road reached a certain wood. Lord Fitzroy Somerset duly awakened his chief, who, mounting the hill, gazed steadily on the French array, and seeing how great was the gap between the moving hostile divisions and the centre, he gave the signal for battle. The whole line, pivoting upon the mountain block, descended into the lower ground, moving upon the flank of the erring enemy, while the third division threw itself forward on the front of the column, and Cotton's horsemen were straining to charge. The contest was brief, for the French division was crushed by the infantry and ridden over by the cavalry, which came like a torrent up the valley, and in less than an hour Marmont's line of battle was irretrievably broken. At the earliest perception of the danger, when he saw that Wellington, detecting his rashness, had prepared to strike, he rode forward to rectify or mitigate the blunder, but was hit severely and carried from the field. Bonnet, who succeeded, shared a like fate, and then the heavy task fell upon Clausel. At that time the whole British line had swung forward, pivoting on the left, until it was again parallel to the Tormes. So swift had been the stroke, and the great cavalry charge had spent its terrible force, 
so that the French, still numerous, were driven to the verge of the forest. By great energy and greater skill, Clausel, himself wounded, formed a fresh front of battle, and even made an attack, but at the right moment when there was apparent danger, Wellington, ever watchful and resolute, brought up the sixth division, frustrated his able foe, and continued to push him back. Clausel was now fighting to cover his retreat. He had one great advantage. The Spanish garrison posted in Alba de Tormes had been withdrawn without notice to Wellington, and thus the French got clear off in the gloom, for Wellington, thinking Alba blocked, pursued to the Huerta Ford, where he found no one. His great plan was thwarted by Spanish neglect. It was in riding to the Huerta Ford that he was struck by a shot, which happily passed through a holster. I saw him late on the evening of that great day, writes Napier, when the advancing flashes of cannon and musketry, stretching as far as the eye could command, showed in the darkness how well the field was won. He was alone, the flush of victory was on his brow, and his eyes were eager and watchful, but his voice was calm and even gentle. How different from the fierce and angry countenance and silent, abrupt bearing seen by the same acute observer on the Sierra de Busaco! It marks the difference between a retreat upon Torres Vedras before the spoilt child of victory and an advance which was to carry him to Madrid. Clausel, with his diminished host, was forced persistently back upon Burgos. King Joseph, who had moved out of Madrid over the Guadarrama mountains, hearing of Marmont's defeat, returned hastily to his capital, which he had to quit again in disorder because the allied right wing was at his heels, and there was no succor nearer than Suchet. Wellington entered Madrid on August 12th and was welcomed as a deliverer by the people who crowded around his horse, hung on his stirrups, touched his clothes, and throwing themselves on the earth, blessed him aloud as the friend of Spain. When he had forced the French garrison in the Retiro to surrender, Madrid for a time was free from the enemy, yet not for many weeks. One object of the campaign was to set free Andalusia, and it was accomplished. Soult, reluctantly obeying the orders of King Joseph, raised the siege of Cadiz, destroyed guns and stores, and a fortnight after Wellington entered Madrid, had passed through Seville on the road to Valencia. An Anglo-Sicilian expedition was at Alicant. Hill watched the passes through the Sierra Morena, and Spanish troops should have followed the French to the Alcaraz Mountains, but did not, which had serious results at a later period. Now it was when the British general received sure intelligence that Soult was leaving Andalusia that he quitted Madrid to push his warfare beyond the Doru. Nor did he move a moment too soon, for the enterprising Clausel drove the Spaniards from Valladolid in the middle of August. Foy made a bold dash down the river to pick up the garrisons left in Taro and Zamora, and the safety of the road to Salamanca was imperiled. But when on the first week of September Wellington crossed the Guadarrama and moved upon the Doru, Clausel drew in his daring troops. Valladolid was recovered, and the able Frenchman was forced back not only to Burgos, but to Briviesca on the Oca. The obstacle now was the castle of Burgos, heavily armed, garrisoned by 1,700 French troops, and commanded by Du Breton, whose fame rivals that of Philippon. Upon the speedy reduction of this stronghold much depended, for it was a question of time, since if Soult could not be detained beyond the Tagus, or if a French army could be collected to relieve the place, the Allies would be forced to retreat upon Ciudad Rodrigo. Wellington began the siege on the 19th, hoping to finish it early, but it was strong. His guns were few and insufficient. The assaults failed, the Portuguese troops were inapt for the work, and the enemy was ingenious as well as bold. Not only were the means inadequate, but the general underrated the task, and after more than a month spent in desperate efforts to beat down the work, he was obliged to raise the siege and hurry away. For the French general Suam, sent from France, had assembled an army at Briviesca and was moving forward. The combinations designed to embarrass Soult had failed. He had joined Joseph at Almansa in the first days of October, 
and both were advancing on madrid nothing stood in their way except the army under hill on the tagus and he could not encounter the combined forces of soult and the king andalusia had been relieved but the whole available french strength was thereby enabled to converge upon the allies with one body numerically superior close upon him and a still more dangerous foe pointing toward his line of retreat upon portugal it behooved wellington to seek safety nor was it easily attained for suam came on with resolution and it was only by the daring step of crossing the arlanzon under the guns of the castle a feat done by night with deftness and celerity that the army was drawn out of reach yet the whole road backward to the doru was the scene of recurring combats for the french are great in pursuit and all wellington's coolness and judgment was required to extricate himself from his peril he succeeded and on the twenty ninth eight days after he filed past burgos his army was over the doru the bridges were broken behind him but a french captain and his company swam the river at tordesillas and won the tower there a feat which would have enabled suam to cross had not wellington at once moved his army to the left and forbade the attempt at this time hill was still on the tagus and opposite to him the king's powerful army under soult the english general was so trusted by his chief that he gave him the choice of his line of retreat but he expressed his preference for the guadarrama route which would enable the two fractions to unite hill took that line yet not before he was pressed and removing or destroying the stores in madrid he passed the mountains and took the shorter line to alba de tormes because suam being expeditious in bridging the doru obliged wellington to retire direct upon san cristobal instead of effecting a junction with hill at aravalo on the adaja thus on november eighth after much marching and fighting the chief and his lieutenant at the head of sixty-eight thousand men were united and arrayed near the battlefield of salamanca while the combined armies of the french a hundred thousand strong were rushing down upon them over the plains of castile and leon the english general held his ground and rested his wearied troops prepared to fight if he could to retreat if he must while marshal jourdain counselled battle soult preferred to manoeuvre and his advice prevailed but it was not until the fourteenth that the french host diminished by detachments to ninety thousand men began the operation of turning the british position by ascending and crossing the tormes in the hope of gaining the road to suidad rodrigo then the allied host was concentrated on the old battleground and held there in the hope of being attacked but as soult still worked away to his left wellington resolved although they were so near to march round the french army a feat which he accomplished by dint of audacity swiftness the aid of a thick fog and better roads an astonishing exploit even in war where so much is unexpected and only explicable on the supposition that wellington's marches victories and good fortune had given him a mastery over the minds of his antagonists thus the roads to suidad rodrigo were secured and on the nineteenth the troops were back on the Agueda the retreat from salamanca was not made without losses of men and baggage the capture of general paget and one sharp combat on the huerba but there the pursuit stopped and the campaign was over a little later the army went into winter quarters over a wide territory and the man who was the soul of the war and the peninsula ever active in so many and such diverse ways began to meditate those final plans which brought his prolonged and mighty exertions to a victorious close although we have not been able to hold the two castiles he wrote to dumouriez november thirtieth from freneda our campaign has not been a bad one and we are in a position to make a good one next year such was his modest way of describing a great success the circumstances of the hour were growing more and more propitious napoleon's gigantic russian invasion had gone to wreck on the day when wellington flitted so deftly from burgos the french emperor had just seen the last of moscow and at the moment when wellington was writing the letter which has been quoted napoleon was dating his dispatches from villages on the right bank of the ice-laden beresina which he had crossed three days before the full extent of his prodigious misfortunes was not then known in freneda 
but enough had been reported to render it certain that the genius of napoleon would be taxed to keep a hold on germany and that he would have few resources or none to spare for spain another fact which gave some little help was that the cortes had sanctioned the appointment of wellington to the post of commander-in-chief of the spanish armies and during the winter he visited cadiz in order to make the arrangement as solid and useful as might be possible far greater in importance was the increased weight conferred on him at home by his victories and the evident fruits of his victories he was raised to the rank of marquis thanked again by both houses and granted one hundred thousand pounds the opposition no longer spoke of him with contempt lord grey who having objected to the vote of thanks proposed after talavera had handsomely retracted his earlier opinions when Massena was driven from portugal now joined lord wellesley in his attack on the government because they had not sufficiently supported their great general as wellington stood apart from politics and served his country the wholesome change wrought at home by the magician's success increased still further his moral power not only over the british the spanish and the portuguese but over the enemy therefore when he received reinforcements during the winter especially in cavalry he was able under better auspices and on firmer ground to prepare for the coming campaign the awful disaster in russia had placed the defenders and invaders of spain on less unequal terms the french army of occupation diminished in number yet still reckoned by the hundred thousand was without a competent head for joseph had induced his brother to recall soult and napoleon imposed on his subordinates in spain tasks which a captain equal to himself alone might have been able to achieve he underrated the obstacles did not or would not understand that the political and military facts had become adverse to his cause and that there was at hand a genius who could profit by the conjuncture wellington indeed was now to secure the reward of his long-tried patience and ever active skill during the spring of eighteen thirteen he set on foot a series of operations all over spain and on her coasts which occupied bewildered and paralyzed the french commanders organized strongly his own army which exceeded seventy thousand men framed a plan of campaign which the adversary could not or did not penetrate and then suddenly breaking in upon them where he was least expected shook down the fabric of their power at one blow the months of labor the astute contrivances the assiduous care which embraced small things as well as great and the far-reaching application of sound business principles to the furtherance of his design must be digested in detail to be appreciated here we can only deal with the bold outlines of the fascinating story the french armies were scattered between toledo and the pyrenees expecting an attack but uncertain where the stroke would fall when the anglo-portuguese army quitting winter quarters started forward into the heart of the disarray sir thomas graham with forty thousand men moved first stealthily crossing the doru at oporto and lomego and working through the trasos montes in order to surprise the french on the esla when he was well forward hill brought up the right wing to behar and the centre assembling in front of suidad rodrigo wellington rode in from freneda and joined that body both pushed out toward salamanca flanked by spanish cavalry and it is written that on passing the agueda on may twenty second the general rose in his stirrups took off his hat and cried farewell portugal so the columns strode along the french outposts falling back before them and so well timed were the marches that both generals arrived together on the tormes where the frenchman villat waited too long and being overtaken near santa marta and aldea lengua his troops suffered and he lost six guns that encounter was followed up by a march on the doru at zamora and toro whither graham had not yet come but by the end of the month his junction with the other columns was secured for wellington leaving hill in command had passed over the doru in a basket slung on a rope stretched from rock to rock and his presence in graham's camp supplied a stimulus which always told then the difficulty of crossing the esla was overcome and bridges being laid on the doru the whole army ninety thousand strong with one hundred guns was soon in line on the right bank of that river as the troops were eager and hardy and the leading good 
a fortnight had sufficed to draw this mass together from widely separated starting points and the result was a complete surprise to an adversary ignorant of graham's march the mighty array beyond the doru seeming to have sprung out of the earth the french astonished and hesitating abandoned madrid and managed to hurry their divisions over the river and get well upon the high road to france after a halt at toro the pursuers sprang forward on june fourth and on the seventh they were over the carrion king joseph was driven to burgos the spaniards swarming on his flanks and the allies at his heels he did not halt but blowing up the castle of burgos hastened with his stores his host of followers his court and his treasure over the ebro holding pancorvo and its forts to cover his position hoping that he might be allowed to regain the lost initiative not so wellington working by his left swung over the ebro far above miranda opened communication with santander as a new base and swept through and over the stony and rugged hills by roads and no roads which fairly turned the enemy's right his soldiers on their arduous way meeting unexpectedly and beating two french brigades thus on the eighteenth while reille who had suffered in that combat held a position on the baya stream at subijana the main body of the french filed through the pass of puebla into the valley of vitoria where after a long race it was brought to bay for Reye, unable to stay on the mountain went over the zadora on the nineteenth and wellington using the following day to reconnoitre framed his plan of battle the zadora flowing from the eastward until it reaches the hills is there shouldered off abruptly to the south and enters the ebro through the defile of puebla within the elbow formed by the river was the french position the right was high up at the bridges near ariaga and gamara mayor and minor not far from vitoria there reye the best french soldier on the field held a position which guarded the high road through tolosa to bayonne but the main body was posted on a traverse ridge six miles to the westward its right resting on the zadora where it bends to the south its left upon the mountain running east from the puebla defile behind vitoria blocking the royal road were the military chest the baggage the equipages of the court and the artillery parks the army was diminished by a strong detachment sent with a convoy toward france but general clausel was approaching from the side of logroño and foy who was in Huispuqua, was ordered up to vitoria those two although clausel came near never reached the field having inspected the ground and being always inclined to go forward and get close he was candidated during his ride wellington resolved to direct graham against reyes troops at gamara and ariaga send hill through the puebla defile to attack the left on the ridge and lead his main body himself straight through the mountains upon the right and centre of the french line the troops were in movement at daybreak on june twenty first eighteen thirteen but they had steep and rough ground to traverse and the action did not begin until the forenoon when hill having cleared the defile pressed in upon the french left at this time wellington's divisions were over the hills and among the woods in the zadora valley heading for the bridges none of which had been broken away on the british left beyond the visible spires of vitoria the smoke of graham's guns rose above the trees and their muffled roar was faintly heard a peasant informed wellington that the bridge at tres puentes was unguarded and kemp's brigade of the light division was instantly sent across established close to the french line and employed at once to fall on the foe up the river and enable the third and seventh divisions to cross almost unopposed then the fourth advanced over the bridge of nanclares and thus the fight was developed on a broad front hill had gained ground on one side picton and dalhousie on the other while the sound of graham's battle became more and more audible the french line was shaken and the king intent on retreat when wellington who had ridden far to the front seeing that a hill near the village of arinas in the centre of the position was barely guarded himself took the third division picton riding at its head dressed in a blue coat and round hat led it at a running pace diagonally across the front of both armies and carried the hill.
the combat now raged along the ridges with great fury for the french were fighting to gain time and form afresh to the rear that time was not granted the hills and villages were seized and sweeping onward the allies drove the enemy step by step through the fields and woods close up to vittoria and all the time graham's artillery thundering on their right rear quickened their pace or steadied their resistance for as the sound did not advance it showed that Reye held his ground the strife in front of vittoria was fierce desperate and prolonged until the line was turned and as the transport blocked the high road to bayonne joseph was obliged to retreat on pampeluna Reye all day defended his bridges which were taken and retaken more than once and saved the army for he did not yield until the headlong pursuers from the main battle rushed in upon him then he ably drew off hotly followed and getting through metalco in the darkness joined the flying host on the road to pamplona such in brief was the decisive victory at vittoria the enemy's loss of men including prisoners was hardly greater than that of the allies five or six thousand but they lost one hundred and fifty out of one hundred and fifty-two guns all their ammunition wagons baggage public and private their provisions transport animals and one million sterling of treasure jordan's baton much jewelry many pictures and a mass of official records were taken while the field was littered with the plunder which the king and his generals had endeavoured to carry away the swiss did not capture more when they surprised charles le rash at grandson in 1476 and took his camp and all that was his to the value of three million crowns while king joseph retreated through the mountains to france pursued by part of the light division wellington was intent on keeping him separated from clausel or snapping up that general if he gave a chance and graham went down the royal road to deal with foy Clausel gave no chance, but descending the Ebro to Saragossa, hastened thence northward and regained his country by the pass of Haka. In passing by Pamplona, the king reinforced the garrison and Foy, before retiring through Tolosa, filled San Sebastian with good troops. None of the invading host save Suchet now remained in Spain, and he was, or thought he was, fully occupied by the insurrection and the anglo-sicilian army in valencia and catalonia in order to secure a new base on the biscayan coast sir thomas graham was ordered to invest and besiege san sebastian and wellington disposed the rest of his army so as to blockade pamplona and cover the siege operations a fortnight after the battle of vittoria the four posts of the allied army were on the french frontier facing their redoubtable adversaries from the famous pass of Roncesvalles to the mouth of the Bidashoa. On the first day of July, Napoleon, in his quarters at Dresden, received disquieting news from Spain, referring apparently to Joseph's retreat from Burgos upon the Ebro. Whatever the scope of that intelligence, it was of a character to make him adopt a strong resolution. Addressing Soult, then in his camp, he said, you will start before ten o'clock this evening travel incognito reach paris on the fourth obtain the best information from the minister of war and the arch-chancellor stay not longer in paris than twelve hours but continue your route to take the command of my armies in spain soult obeyed with such diligence that on july twelfth he reached bayonne and took on himself a burden too heavy for joseph and jourdain and although the army was not in spain it still derived its title from that ill-used country napoleon at this time fresh from his latest triumphs at lutzen and bautzen hoped that his lieutenant would preserve the line of the ebro and ward off danger from that quarter an armistice had stopped hostilities in germany but it only covered preparations on both sides for a future and deadlier struggle while providing soult with nearly a hundred thousand men the emperor believed he could make head against the coalition to colincourt his plenipotentiary at prague where the powers were conferring he said tell them that if they wish to prolong the armistice i am ready if they wish to fight i am ready and reporting what was the fact that on july twenty fourth twenty fifth really 
soult had marched on pamplona the english he said surprised by a prompt movement which they did not expect were falling back before the marshal's host end of section eleven section twelve of wellington by george hooper this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter eight wellington's offensive campaigns part two and it was so sir thomas graham began the siege of san sebastian on the tenth on the twenty fifth his troops were repulsed in an attempt to storm through the breaches and wellington hastening to the camp suspended all further operations because while there he got news that soult whose advance was expected had burst in on the right of the british line therefore wellington hurried back to lesaca and arrived in time to deal with his formidable adversary then ensued that exciting strife on the mountains and amid the valleys which can only be appreciated if studied in detail for which here there is no space in order to cover graham's siege and the blockade of pamplona the greater part of the british army was posted on the north side of the central ridge which crossed all the ravines and vales from roncesvalles to lecumberi thus the line was long and by selecting the extreme right as the point of attack soult secured to himself the greatest advantages and the best chances of beating his opponent in fractions he therefore cleverly assembled clausel and reille's divisions near st jean pied de port and directed them upon the passes of lindus and ibanieta while their lance divisions starting from espalette assailed the centre under hill the advance was made on the twenty fifth the very day when wellington galloped to san sebastian and it succeeded so far as to press back both fronts yet not enough to master the ridge on the first day for cole and bing stoutly resisting on the british right and derlon halting after a fierce combat on the col de maya wellington was able when he rode to the front on the twenty sixth to direct all the troops within reach upon the valley of lantz where they would be in communication with picton who took command on that side so on the twenty seventh the whole line was in full retreat the french followed fast but on that day soult with clausel and ray's men pouring through the val zumbiri were stopped by picton who faced about on the hills near pamplona the same evening when the french endeavoured to seize the heights above zabaldica and sororen they were promptly repelled by coal and forced to form up in the narrow highlands between the val zubiri and the val of the lance then wellington arrived he had ridden down the lance valley from ostis and had entered sororen as clausel was approaching along the hills he wrote a dispatch on the bridge parapet which lord fitzroy somerset his sole staff officer at that moment carried to hill and dalhousie who were approaching from the left then he rode towards villalba and as his well-known form and face appeared the troops sent up hearty cheers of welcome it is related that soult was pointed out to wellington as he sat on his horse separated from the marshal only by a narrow gulf and that the british captain then uttered some sentences which have become famous yonder he is reported to have said yonder is a great commander but he is cautious and will delay his attack to ascertain the cause of these cheers that will give time for the sixth division to arrive and i shall beat him the sixth had been told they must arrive at their destination and he knew that they would obey thus when night fell and a tempest shook the hills both armies stood between the gui and the lance torrents making ready for the morrow on that day the twenty eighth soult's troops attacked with great hardiness but as foreseen the sixth division had come up on the british left and the french were repulsed again and again even when they had perseveringly climbed on to the rocky crest when the evening came wellington's sixteen thousand though considerably diminished in number after the bludgeon work as he called it had victoriously thwarted the valorous onsets of nearly double their strength and the main purpose of soult was frustrated for the british divisions marching in the mountains were nearer together than the french 
the light division only being or seeming to be afar and in danger quiet prevailed on the twenty ninth but on the thirtieth soult joined d'erlon who had come up to lisasso and was about to fall upon hill's weaker force the french marshal formed a new plan of operations which would have placed his army in Wispusqua, but he reckoned without his host for on that very day while d'erlon was fighting hill wellington struck a direct blow at rey and clausel on the old ground of sororen defeated them utterly pushed on in pursuit compelled a great body under foy to retreat on france by a separate line and thus left soult himself isolated with only one pass open to him that of doña maria over it he went and though closely pursued he halted in san esteban it was here that except by one exit he was surrounded wellington watching from the hills awaited the fitting moment to close on his opponent straggling was prohibited no fires were permitted but suddenly he saw three red-coated marauders who had entered the valley snapped up by four french gendarmes and soon after the drums beat and the enemy was seen in column of march headed for sumbilla and the bridge at yancey the british followed the spaniards came down to the bridge the light division appeared on the other bank of the bidashoa and the french filing through the narrow ledge between the cliffs and the torrent under a hot fire turned off toward echalar from that point they were driven on august second and on the third after ten days of march and battle the french were again in their own frontier the losses in both armies had been great but the defeated french were the more heavily punished in the combat near echalar wellington was nearly captured as he was examining his maps his forward habit constantly led him into peril but he never grew more cautious either in action or on the march and always rode where he judged his presence would be useful he has been blamed for not while his opponents were in disorder at once pushing his advantages on the spot he judged differently and considered that san sebastian must be reduced before he entered on so great an enterprise as the invasion of france besides suchet and catalonia inspired him with misgivings in the spanish war he had never to reckon with only the enemy in his front it was his duty and habit to survey the whole political and military field which really embraced germany as well as spain and follow that course which seemed more likely to secure solid and lasting results therefore he resumed the siege of san sebastian during the whole year he was not seconded by the government at home as well as he should have been for not only did the ordnance office languidly comply with demands for guns and ammunition but the admiralty did not maintain such a squadron on the coasts of spain and portugal as would have enabled supply ships to sail when required and might perhaps have prevented the french from pouring men and stores into the fortress by sea when the battering trains did arrive the complement of ammunition was not in quantity proportional to the guns so that there was first delay and then grave neglect and wellington did not leave the admiralty in doubt respecting his opinion of their shortcomings the plan of attack was censured at the time apparently on grounds justified by the results but to say that the place was taken by accident is a perverse exaggeration it was won by sheer valour and the explosion which gave so decided an advantage to the assailants was one of a kind not uncommon in war the siege was begun again on august fifth when soult had been chased to his frontier but the real work could not commence until the twenty second because the guns from home had not arrived the assault was made on the thirty first and the garrison driven into the castle where the stout governor emmanuel ray held out until september eighth when his rocky refuge was a ruin the operations were impressively dramatic and gave full scope to the bravery of the portuguese as well as to the heroism of the british soldier but some hideous atrocities which followed on the storming although they were perpetrated by a few threw a dark stain on the whole unjustly perhaps yet inevitably and the sack of san sebastian figures as an indelible disgrace neither graham nor wellington could have prevented the shameful acts which filled them with rage 
but both deeply resented and finally repelled the calumnies which like a monstrous growth sprang out of facts sufficiently horrible in their naked reality the officers on duty did all they could to restrain and punish the offenders wellington's share in the siege was intermittent but he had so much to do and besides the business was graham's but he did more than once interfere and four days after the assault he was on the breach in conversation with colonel john burgoyne who had succeeded to the command of the engineers when sir richard fletcher was killed the loss inflicted on the allies in this murderous siege approached the total of three thousand killed and wounded and the garrison was reduced to one half their original strength at this price the general bought a fortress of the utmost value to him as a secure place for hospitals and magazines although the value was impaired by the dreadful conflagration begun by the french as part of the defence and perhaps enlarged by the plunderers unwilling to allow san sebastian to fall without another attempt to delay if not avert its capture soult crossed the bidashoa on the last day of august when the stormers were vainly struggling to win the breach and the shot from graham's guns were smashing the curtain wall above them he had made close and powerful combinations to break through the allied line and his columns did push up the huge spurs of the pena de Haya mountain but forewarned wellington was prepared and ready to repel the front attack the french came on in two large masses between irun and vira one under rea was repulsed on the heights of san marcial where stimulated by wellington's voice and gestures the spaniards were prevailed upon to stand alone the other commanded by clausel after pushing up the steeps was paralyzed by a strong demonstration on his left rear from the side of la Saca. in the afternoon a tempest deluged hill and valley staying the battle and converting the stream into a swollen torrent and while the greater part of the french got back in safety one brigade was caught at the bridge of vera and lost its general the stroke was heavy but it failed to relieve san sebastian the aggregate losses of both sides exceeded five thousand men so well did each fight and in the end soult felt constrained to stand on the defensive for the future and use the pick and spade to fortify the slopes and summits of the folded hills between the nivelle and the bidashoa he had more than a month for preparation there were three things which operated to hinder the advance of the allies the steadfastness of the governor of pamplona the state of the war in germany and the superiority maintained by the french on the east coast of spain where although suchet had retired to catalonia and blown up the old walls of tarragona he still defeated lord william bentinck at ordal and held on to the province but when pamplona surrendered at the end of october when the intelligence from saxony showed that napoleon was worsted by the allied armies when it seemed almost certain that suchet would not act with soult the field marshal finished the plans for the invasion of france which he had resolved to undertake as soon as san sebastian fell i am waiting here the saca he wrote to his brother on september twelfth till the animals of the pontoon train will be relieved from the work consequent on the siege when i shall cross the bidashoa showing that even then his plan of movement was conceived from vera october thirty first he wrote it is impossible that napoleon can stand and the confederation of the rhine is gone at that time however his troops had entered france the able manoeuvres which carried him over the frontier began on october seventh by the passage of the bidashoa long prepared and preceded by movements designed to deceive his adversary when set in operation they took soult by surprise for the allies broke in upon his long line of earthworks obstructions and mountain crests precisely where they were not expected calculating the time to a minute the time being dependent on the tide wellington sent a strong column from fuentarabia and irun over the river just above its mouth poured a serried host from the heights of san marcial and the bridge of vera upon the centre and left and fighting all day not only mastered the low country toward the sea but drove the french out of their strong works thrown up to defend the rugged hills and on the eighth 
captured and occupied the very summit of the great ruine the loftiest hill in those parts so that the french were forced back into the fortified lines constructed on both banks of the nivelle and wellington again proved to soult that he could cross a river in the face of a large army another month elapsed in relative quiet during which wellington tendered his resignation of command over the spanish army justly indignant with the spanish authorities who shamefully neglected their troops in the field and broke their covenants with the generalissimo at the same time a very able soldier sir john hope joined the army where his presence was most welcome the field marshal's three lieutenants being now hope beresford and hill early in november another forward move was made and on the tenth and eleventh the allies skilfully directed tumbled the french out of all their fortifications drove and followed them over the nivelle taking fifty-one guns all the field magazines and many hundreds of prisoners by the twelfth soult was established in and about the entrenched camp of bayonne a series of formidable works on both sides of the adour though he required every available sabre and bayonet for offensive operations wellington at this time ordered all his spanish troops except morillo's division into spain as a punishment for their deeds of plunder and outrage in contravention of his proclamation which he intended should be obeyed promising protection to the persons and property of the french people this evident proof of his good faith brought provisions to his camps but the violence of the spaniards and the want of money always very pressing prevented him from carrying out his great plans early in december despite difficulties of all kinds he once more assumed the offensive and effected the passage of the neve above its confluence with the adour the work was finally done on december ninth but as the allied army was separated by the neve soult thought he had a good chance of winning a victory by falling on the left under hope thus taking advantage of what is called wellington's overconfidence he therefore started forth and during three days strove ineffectually to profit by the opportunity thus offered failing to defeat hope he turned upon hill and on this occasion had his best chance but hill was equal to the stress put on him and wellington who had watched and sustained the battle with fresh troops taking the offensive soult again thwarted drew his main body over the adour the allies lost many hundreds and had five generals wounded the french loss was more severe and at the end of the last day's fighting three german regiments passed into the camp of the allies another period of comparative inactivity followed comparative for although the troops were quiet their captain was incessantly occupied devising modes of feeding them wrestling with the foolishness of the spanish portuguese and british governments even with the gold he received coining napoleons because that money could be the more easily exchanged by his soldiers his repeated and plain-spoken remonstrances had produced some change for the better in the admiralty and consequently in the cooperation of the navy still he had to resist plans suggested from home and he always suffered from want of funds but when the allies had crossed the rhine and napoleon had begun his inimitable though fruitless campaign of eighteen fourteen wellington also pressed upon his able adversary whose forces had been diminished to reinforce the emperor and yet remained within a few hundreds equal to those of the british field marshal in february he was once more in motion executing a plan which was not his least masterly conception intending to invest bayonne he boldly resolved to throw a great bridge over the adour below the town and to facilitate the project assailed the french left thus drawing soult away from the fortified camp while sir john hope and admiral penrose worked together to bridge the broad tidal stream repeated and successful manoeuvres and attacks between the upper course of the neve and the adour deceived and bewildered soult who receded farther and farther from the decisive point then hope accomplished his daring enterprise with greater daring and between the twenty fourth and twenty fifth of february after severe labours he mastered the river and invested bayonne by the time this great exploit was finished wellington had compelled soult to retreat over the gave d'oleron 
and even the Gave de Pain, on the right bank of which he halted to fight at Ortez. Beresford passed the stream some miles below, and moving up the right bank to Bates, covered the passage of all the army at Berenx, except Hill's two divisions, which were opposite the bridge of Ortez and threatened the French left. Soult, uncertain of the strength before him, formed a fresh line of battle, and on February 27th, instead of being, as he had designed, the assailant, found himself the defender. For some time he kept Beresford at bay on his right, repelled an attack on his left, and thought he was about to defeat his old opponent. If so, he was over-sanguine. Wellington, who had been watching the conflict from an elevated central position on the site of a Roman camp, finding he could not break in on the french right wing developed a powerful attack along the whole front and sent the fifty second regiment across a marsh to smite the exposed inner flank of the right wing hill at the same time ascended the river to find a point of passage and by the time he was crossing at Suar, the combined onset organized on the roman camp especially the hardy march and fighting of the fifty second had disordered and overthrown the enemy who, finding himself worsted at all points and Hill menacing his rear, yielded the field, and only essayed a formation to cover the retreat. As Hill was now over on the Pau Road, that line was gone, and Soult was obliged to flit away toward saint Save on the Adour in order to preserve his communication with Toulouse. He succeeded by dint of rapid marching, breaking down as he moved the bridges on the many streams, in this battle the french lost six guns and wellington was wounded being struck from his horse yet he speedily rose to his feet and it is said laughed at alava who was hit in a soft part always a source of mirth the contusion or the deep bridgeless rivers perhaps both stayed the rapidity of pursuit and the next day all the french on the saint save road were over the adour hill moving on the right had a sharp skirmish with clozel at air defeated him and seized his magazines those at docks and mont saint marsan also were captured the french marshal now cut off from bordeaux fearful of being driven into the land and still hoping that suchet might come to his aid clung to the spurs of the pyrenees and covered the roads to toulouse wellington followed as far as the country about air but there he halted for some days having detached beresford and two divisions to bordeaux the bourbons were already in the field but the general did not directly help them being restrained from that course by his own government and honestly stating the truth to the bourbon partisans who incurred his wrath when they endeavoured to force his hand finding wellington inactive soult actually resumed the offensive on march thirteenth pushing his divisions close up to air that bold movement however did not succeed for wellington who had got back beresford and one of his divisions from bordeaux retorted on his adversary with such vigour that he was forced to fall back rapidly through tarbes and saint gaudon to his entrenched position at toulouse at this time the population of the districts through which poured the streams of warfare far from rising in arms did nothing to aid soult and brought provisions readily into the british camps and they did this because they were scrupulously well treated and paid for all they supplied the english general's policy a french official wrote and the good discipline he maintains does us more harm than ten battles every peasant wishes to be under his protection that is decisive testimony if any were needed but it must be admitted that the spanish divisions sent back because they were guilty of outrage yet some of which he was obliged to call up afresh nearly effaced by their crimes the good feeling won by the general's noble conduct the french peasants were tired of the long and exacting wars of napoleon and if they were not eager for the bourbons they were athirst for peace soult believed he could make good his strong post in front of toulouse for he had fortified the mont rave a high ridge rising between the stream of the air and the canal on the eastern face of the town while the entrenched suburb of saint cyprien in a loop on the left bank defended the bridge over the garonne the allies came up on that side but in order to master the defences of toulouse after several tentative measures above wellington keeping hill before saint cyprien 
through his bridges below sent over all the other divisions and cutting off soult from montauban moved up the air into the narrow space between it and the french lines that involved a flank march by two divisions under fire in order to reach and storm a height on the south the troops endured the loss and carried the height and although the spaniards suffered reverses from assaulting the northern redoubts too soon and picton was repelled when he changed a false into a real attack yet beresford's divisions the fourth and sixth overpowered their foes and charging along and through the works on the mont rave obliged soult to withdraw behind the canal yet he still held fast to the redoubts and bridges which defended and gave access to the carcassonne road his only available line of retreat this was not done without much persevering fighting and always at great risk but it was done the french lost five and the allies four generals and several thousand men killed and wounded soult fearing that he might be cut off altogether withdrew from toulouse on the night of the eleventh leaving eight guns and his wounded to the conqueror who the next day entered toulouse here terminated the last act of wellington's campaigns begun in portugal and finished in france the sanguinary fight on the garonne and the still later sortie from bayonne were both subsequent to the abdication of napoleon that great event was virtually completed on april seventh but not officially communicated to the allied powers until the eleventh and of course could not be and was not known to soult before the battle of toulouse nor would he recognize the fall of his emperor until an aide-de-camp brought the authentic papers from napoleon himself then the british army which had done so much was dispersed and its general travelled to paris where he arrived early in may to find himself duke of wellington he was not allowed to stay long in the french capital as his presence was requested in madrid where ferdinand the seventh of evil memory had at length ascended the throne to that monarch he gave honest advice but it availed nothing as a grandee of spain the duke was entitled to keep his hat on in the royal presence but he did not know it during his stay in madrid the king showed himself to the people from a balcony of the palace while his suite stood in a room behind the people i believe said wellington to crocker in the king desired me to come forward which i did bareheaded of course i should have done so anywhere else the king immediately said to me be covered in the face of the people i could not at once bring myself to do it but the people about us hastened to remind me that i was a grandee of the first class and that i ought to have been covered fortunately he had been engaged in more serious labours than a study of the privileges belonging to a spanish grandee quitting spain he returned in june through paris to england having been abroad steadfast in his country's service without a break for five years what he did in that period we have seen how crowded how splendid the vista which runs back from the triumph of eighteen fourteen to the passage of the doru in eighteen o nine he had freed lisbon the year before now he was set forth upon an enterprise in the success of which few believed the liberation of portugal as a step to the liberation of spain but although napoleon was the master of the continent sir arthur wellesley when he began his stupendous task saw the weak plates in the giant's armour and believed firmly that he could pierce his vitals napoleon also detected at once the new power which had struck into the strife on the peninsula and after a porto he never ceased to tell his brother and his marshals that there was nothing in portugal or spain except the english that was why his great lieutenant perhaps his greatest Massena was sent to overwhelm the dreaded adversary. In the prince's path arose not only the soldiers of Busaco, but the lines of Torres Vedras, which revealed the most profound as well as the grandest conception of the time. The defense of those lines was the turning point in the war, and if the large consequences did not make the British ministers see that every man, gun, and guinea they could spare should be given to Wellington, it was because the ministers were not nor could they be expected to be the equals of the general who alone at that time scanning the future foresaw what could be done 
it was his patience not less than his vast business knowledge and inventiveness which helped him to win he could wait as well as strike his enemies called him cautious and timid just as after talavera they called him rash and adventurous yet in one winter he wrested from them two great fortresses and made them the warders of the little realm he guarded and when he had fixed himself firmly on his frontier he marched into spain beating marmont at salamanca as he had beaten massena at fuentes d'anoro frustrated at burgos and followed in retreat by a great host he showed soult on the dormes that he could manoeuvre as well as fight and when once more in portugal he had the satisfaction of knowing that his marches and battles had raised the siege of cadiz and liberated the whole of andalusia napoleon went to russia and furnished the opportunity for which wellington had fought and waited and watched the next campaign carried his country's flag through the field of vittoria to the crests of the pyrenees expelling from spain all french armies save one on the east coast and bringing the invasion of france within the reach of his arm nothing stopped him when he sprang forward neither the fortified mountains nor the deep and abounding rivers nor the gallant soldiers of france nor at the end the mighty entrenchments of toulouse we can see the shining results of five years unremitting endeavour and track the passage of the great captain from the rock of lisbon to the shores of the garonne but what none can now fully realize are the vast and varied obstacles which beset his career and that of his matchless soldiers and the ingenious devices which he contrived to lessen or overcome them that which carried him through was not only his quality as a great and daring commander but his honesty and uprightness as a man his single aim was the service of his country and he never swerved from that high standard throughout his long ordeal he defined himself in regard to spain as a concurrent sans ambition adding all the world knew that i desired nothing but to beat the french out of spain and then go home to my own country leaving the spaniards to manage theirs as they pleased and we have seen that his endurance moderation and genius enabled him to achieve his desire all through his life it will be found that duty and service were his guiding stars he went home from the field of his infinite labours peace seemed to have closed a horrid era of bloodshed yet only seemed for the great conqueror who was not without ambition was brooding in his island of elba how he might retrieve the throne he had solemnly renounced if not the predatory empire which he had staked and lost End of section twelve Section thirteen of Wellington by George Hooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter nine. Waterloo. Part one. Weary of war, yet proud of her own unyielding obstinacy in the prolonged contest, England heartily welcomed back a general who, like John Churchill a hundred years before, brought home her colors rent indeed in the tempest of battle yet untarnished by defeat if his strong character was not spoiled by popular applause it was not the fault of his admirers when he reached westminster bridge on june twenty third eighteen fourteen the multitude dragged his carriage to the house of the duchess in hamilton place the next day lord bathurst hurried him to portsmouth where the regent and his guests the emperors and kings were to witness a naval review returning he took his seat as a peer all his titles having been conferred since he sailed for lisbon in eighteen o nine he was thanked and congratulated on the part of the house of commons by a committee of fifteen as was the duke of marlborough and on july first clad in field marshal's uniform and wearing the garter and the golden fleece he thanked the house in person from a place within the bar on the left of the entrance expressing his gratitude for the noblest gift that any subject had ever received the grant of four hundred thousand pounds voted on may twelfth a week later he carried the sword of state when the solemn thanksgiving for peace was rendered in st paul's and in july the city gave him a banquet in the guildhall it was the high yet not the highest tide of his popularity that was to come 
and we may infer from his letters that without being unduly elated he received plaudits and honours alike as marks of the confidence felt in him by the princes and the people but his judgment was not misled nor was his manly simplicity of character impaired by this outburst of enthusiasm in all ranks the duke did not long enjoy a well-won period of rest at home always ready as he told the house of commons to serve his majesty in any capacity the ministers speedily sent him as ambassador to the capital of france precisely where his presence one might have imagined would be unwelcome to so many on the road he took a military survey of belgium when his eye was attracted by the position at waterloo in relation to the great lines of operation from the side of france and he reported on the fortresses which were the wrecks of the old barrier the embassy to paris was not productive of much advantage before the winter came hostility was shown by the courtiers in the palace as well as the bonapartists in the streets and the ministers fearing that some mischance might occur were anxious to bring him home they invented the pretext of sending him to command in america but he steadfastly refused to be frightened away and so far prevailed that lord liverpool at length gave him permission to select his own time of departure from a post he should not have been selected to fill he said that as matters stood the ministers could not allow him to quit europe for should anything occur and he repeatedly pointed to its probability there is nobody but myself he wrote in whom either yourselves or the country or your allies would feel any confidence so he stayed on until the spring was near and then quitted paris to replace lord castlereagh at the congress of quarrelsome sovereigns held in vienna peace had come but it rested on no solid basis hardly on any basis at all the conquerors all the winter were on the point of fighting for the spoil and it was evident at an early hour that a new war could only be avoided by a series of compromises in the redistribution of territory the measure of the peril is the secret treaty of alliance between austria france and england to resist the northern powers who had extensive views on saxony and poland when the treaty of vienna is criticised it should never be forgotten that it was the price of peace in europe and that the end sought by those who most fiercely denounced it could only have been attained if at all which is doubtful by another twenty or thirty years of internecine war the english government consented to rather than concurred in the arrangements they were obliged to take part because without them there could have been no general settlement and the penalty of refusal would have been battle and confusion the issue out of the chaos was one not foreseen napoleon in elba affecting to be an amour absorbed in the management of his household his cows and his poultry closely watched the course of events and gradually prepared to make his spring he was in communication direct or indirect with the discontented fragments of his old armies the temper of which wellington detected soon after he set foot in paris dumouriez as early as december saw clearly into the facts when he said that napoleon was not the namor that he had been imprudently placed too near france and italy and that his spirit reigning through and through the french army still fed him with hope murat in naples was also and always a more or less faithful ally of the deposed emperor sure to stir if the latter showed signs of vitality the movements of murat indeed correspond with the ceaseless but careful preparations of his brother-in-law and the king of naples would not have been condemned for selfish haste had the emperor napoleon finally been victorious the peace with the united states terminating a war mainly begun and waged to serve napoleon and the slave power though based on a good pretext was an event adverse to the plans meditated in the island of elba but it may have helped to precipitate their execution before the flower of the british army could be brought over the atlantic in other respects the emperor who had good grounds to work on judged that the conditions were favourable and early in march the startled congress learned first that he was in france striding triumphantly toward the capital and next that he was once more master of the resources of france 
it was the military spirit detected by dumouriez and noticed by wellington which enabled napoleon to march unopposed from the gulf of juan to the tuileries the miracle was wrought in his name but it was the work of the army the marshals have recalled bonaparte said ney to the prefect of saint -Ain, because they were insulted by the men about the king i know all that we have to fear he added but i would rather be brayed in a mortar by bonaparte than humiliated by fellows who never fought les émigrés ont encore perdu le roi the statement was not true of all the marshals but the words of ney fairly paint the time the bonapartists may have conspired sur la place publique but napoleon knew well what armed support he could get when he embarked at porto ferraio whence three thousand years ago etruscan populonia drew its stores of iron the sovereigns and plenipotentiaries at vienna acted with promptitude and unanimity on march seventh when the courier brought wellington the news from florence that napoleon had quitted elba they set their armies in motion toward france and metternich records that at pressburg a few days later a regiment of cuirassiers defiled before wellington on its way to the rhine which a short time before he had seen in vienna on its road to quarters in hungary wellington himself as usual looked to business and was at ease you will have seen what a breeze bonaparte has stirred up in france he wrote to his brother henry on march twenty fourth we are all unanimous here and in the course of about six weeks rather a sanguine estimate there will not be fewer than seven hundred thousand men on the french frontier i am going to take the command of the army in the netherlands where we may note the prince of orange if not general kleist was in great alarm hurry out everything no time must be lost the prince wrote to lord bathurst on the same day when napoleon reported to be at lille was actually in the tuileries where he had been installed three days in paris shrewd observers at that moment looking realities in the face saw in the return from elba war implacable immediate universal not only because napoleon was a menace to the kings but still more a menace to liberty napoleon said m de fontaine de villemain napoleon cannot endure this time because he no longer enjoys the natural conditions of life his quarrel is now said another more with the peoples than their rulers he might conquer at first but he must fall in the end one pulse throbbed through europe and in france there was neither hope nor enthusiasm outside the pale of the army napoleon who had renounced his solemn renunciation of the french throne was placed by the congress hors la roi in the declaration adopted on march thirteenth and the treaty of the twenty fifth provided the means of enforcing the judgment of the public tribunal it was after this instrument had been signed that napoleon started for brussels where he arrived on april fourth there he began the hard task of forming an army managing the king of the netherlands the most difficult person to get on with i ever met and knitting closely his relations with that portion of the prussian army which had been brought on the ground the english ministry found it impossible to furnish the promised quota of troops from any source nor could they supply wellington with the forty thousand british infantry and fifteen thousand british cavalry with which he would have been satisfied yet by degrees the trusty little host grew stronger as the transports poured into ostend and the continental troops assigned to him reached belgium but at the end of may he could only muster one hundred and five thousand men of varied nationalities for all purposes while the british and germans upon whom he could thoroughly rely formed little more than a third of the force available for service in the field at the same period the prussians had become a considerable mass and both armies were in close communication napoleon on regaining power at once set about organizing an army on the basis of the troops he found afoot but a large nominal force of all kinds only gave him some hundred and thirty thousand men for the invasion of belgium he tried hard but failed to gain time and then instead of waiting until the allies were ready to attack he quitted paris on june twelfth and fell upon his foremost foes the quality of these three armies varied greatly 
napoleon's array was one of the best he ever led being composed in the main of veterans the prussians were all of one nation they also had fought in the war of independence and were animated by the fierce and lofty spirit which years of subjection had aroused the duke's army was composite britons hanoverians dutch belgians brunswickers nassauers in no way equal to the hardy soldiers who stormed through the pyrenees i command a very small british army with a very large british staff to which my superiors are adding every day he wrote three weeks before the campaign opened at an earlier period he begged the horse guards to refrain from forwarding more generals until they sent him troops he thought the british government were afraid to touch the question of war they had so unaccountably delayed their preparations in the end he had to do his best with an army which contained only thirty thousand british troops of all arms including the german legion which was second to none when napoleon drove out of paris on june twelfth the allied forces in belgium the only part of the great alliance ready for battle were posted at different points between audenard on the scheldt and liege on the meuse the british on the right drew their supplies from ostend and antwerp the prussians from cologne blucher had his headquarters at namur wellington at brussels and each was prepared to assist the other by marching to the right or left or concentrating on the centre should that be assailed now through that centre ran the high road to brussels cut almost at right angles at quatre bras by the transverse line of communication between nivelle and namur which secured the connection between the two armies wellington's troops except the reserve in and near the belgian capital were all to his right or west of the central highway and blucher's on the left except that seaton's corps was at charlois and extended beyond it up the sambre toward maubeuge and therefore in front of the british troops near mons napoleon noting this distribution resolved to strike at the line of junction hoping that by long swift marches he might interpose a mass between the two defeat each in succession or drive them to unite if they could beyond brussels it was a bold project but one which imposed on his troops labours greater than they could perform and in addition allowed nothing for accident or fortune requiring for success the exact and punctual fulfilment of its exorbitant demands wellington did not divine as it is called the plan of this master in the practice of war and thought to the end of his days that napoleon might have done better and this misjudgment though it did not prevent his success is paraded as a proof of his inferiority as a general napoleon therefore started with a great advantage he was going to strike where he was least expected and by skilful management he was able to concentrate his army almost though not quite unobserved just within the french frontier opposite the supposed gap or weak place through which he intended to break his departure from paris was known at namur and brussels Zieten's troops who kept a vigilant watch saw the red flush of the french bivouac fires above the forest and the allies were alert and ready to move wellington did not issue any order or change the distribution of his divisions when he knew only that napoleon was on the frontier but he was ready to march to his left just as blucher was ready to close to his own right the difference was that wellington desired some definite indication that the emperor was not about to strike at his communications with england whereas blucher who had no need to fear for his line of supply was eager at the first warning to take up a position for battle so it fell out that on the night of the fourteenth when napoleon's orders were actually issued blucher directed Seaton, if attacked to retire fighting on fleurus and his three other corps to concentrate behind it at son bref but on the fourteenth no information would ever reach brussels which went farther than the fact that napoleon was on the frontier the reason for the difference is that the prussian outposts touched the french army and therefore the intelligence from the front went swiftly to namur and slowly to brussels the situation strongly illustrates the grave danger attending the operations of allied armies acting in concert from divergent bases under independent commanders 
one commander-in-chief would have known all that was to be known and have guided himself accordingly while the prussian corps were moving on the fifteenth from liege namur and Sine toward the chosen field of ligny not a man stirred from the british cantonments the french at dawn sprang forward in three columns Reilly and derlon down the sambre vandamme lobeau and napoleon direct from beaumont upon charleroi and girard from philippeville upon chatelet though Tsiten forgot to break down the bridges still he ably handled his retreating troops delayed the enemy kept up a bold front and at eventide remained in possession of fleurus accidents and misunderstandings for which napoleon did not allow actually occurred and at night the farthest points attained by his leading troops were Frannes, Wagnet, and Lamboussard. The rear extended to the right bank of the Sambre near Charleroi, and to the left bank of that river opposite Châtelet. The emperor was satisfied with the day's work, and if we may judge from his language, retired to Charleroi in the confident belief that the next day his troops would be in Brussels not the faintest intimation that anything unusual had occurred in the valley of the sambre reached the british headquarters until three in the afternoon for eleven hours there had been steady marching and fighting within forty miles of brussels and ten miles of the british outposts at Fran. yet not a whisper of conflict was heard by wellington the prince of orange rode in from nivelle and brought to the duke about three o'clock a report that some skirmish or hostile movement had happened at Toulon, and a very little later General Neufling received a dispatch from Namur giving the same or similar intelligence. Upon that, Wellington would not act decisively. He awaited a messenger from Mons. But he issued orders for all the divisions to concentrate at fixed points and stand prepared to march. Some time before midnight, direct information came from the outposts of Mons all there being quiet that the french attack was directed upon charleroi where the infantry fire was very hot and then he sent out orders for the troops to march by nivelle braine le comte and enguin that is from right to left toward the scene of conflict the reserve was to march from brussels by waterloo and genappe at midnight the duke called on meufling to tell him what he had done so that blucher might be informed the numerous friends of napoleon here will be on tiptoe he said to the german general the well-intentioned must be pacified let us therefore go to the duchess of richmond's ball and start for quatre bras at five a m the remark and the action are alike characteristic of one whose equanimity rarely broke down and never in moments of peril he had done all he could when his orders were issued and considering how strong the french or rather the bonapartists were in belgium he was wise when he showed his serene and cheerful countenance at a ball destined to be famous in the morning he set out for the front and near waterloo passed the reserve then halted and eating their breakfast and riding onward reached quatre bras around eleven finding that the french were only skirmishing with the outposts toward Frannes, he sent an order for the reserve to march from waterloo and then rode off by the namur road to the prussian position which he entered by the right rear and joined blucher at the windmill of bussy between ligny and brie there he undertook to give the prussians direct aid providing he was not attacked himself but from his own observation and the reports of sir henry harding he gravely doubted whether the Prussians would be able to escape a defeat, and when he got back about three o'clock to Quatre Bras, he saw enough to convince himself that he also would have a hard task to maintain his ground. At this moment, when the struggle on both fronts had begun, when the sound of Napoleon's battle was audible plainly at Quatre Bras, and Ney's onset had become severe and continuous, we may briefly sketch the general situation blucher had concentrated three corps at ligny and would have had four but for one of those accidents which are not infrequent in war the emperor in error at first respecting the strength of the prussians he called them a body of troops as soon as he was better informed brought up two corps and the guard keeping lobo in reserve 
on the brussels road ne had two corps but it was not until about three o'clock that the whole of one of them Rey, was up to the front while the other derlon the victim of error and zeal wandered between the two armies all day useless to either wellington's divisions except two dutch belgian brigades present on the field were all on the march and on their arrival he depended to frustrate ne Muffling, seeing the state of affairs on the spot, had taken care to let Blucher know that no help could come to him from his ally. On his return from Bussy, the English general found the Prince of Orange contending with a force superior in all arms, yet not strong enough to seize Quatre Bras. The Duke's presence gave new life to the battle, and when Picton's division, followed by the Brunswickers and von Merrill's Belgian horse, arrived, he took the offensive pushing forward right up to the edge of the farm of Gemioncourt. Ney, reinforced by the rest of Rey's corps and part of Kellermann's cavalry, violently retorted, and in the charge which partially broke into spray before the squares, Wellington ran the risk of death or capture. But he leaped his horse over the ninety-second Highlanders lining the ditch on the Namur road, while his gallant pursuers, cut up by the infantry fire, were killed or driven off. Ney was further reinforced by more guns and cavalry, and Wellington's brigades continued to arrive in parcels. The marshal was always superior in horsemen and cannon, but after five o'clock his opponent had larger numbers of foot. Holding firmly to the crossroads and the highway to Namur, Wellington became the stronger as the day waned, and when the guards emerged from the Nivelle road and the Allies pressed forward, Ney, who had no fresh troops, was driven back and his antagonist remained at sundown master of the whole field of battle the position was maintained but the cost was great for there were no fewer than four thousand six hundred killed and wounded more than half being british soldiers the thunder of the cannon to the eastward had also died away but none knew as yet at quatre bras how blucher had fared at the hands of his redoubtable foe Wellington, who slept at his headquarters in Genappe, was on the field and scrutinizing his outposts at daybreak on the 17th. Soon after came a report, confirmed a little later, that the Prussians had retreated on Wavre. Their rear guard had remained all night near the French, and when they retired by Tilly and Gentine, their foes missed all trace of them. Napoleon had a belief that Blucher would retire upon Liège, which caused him at a late hour in the day to dispatch Grouchy to that side, and thus touch was lost. While the French were cooking and Napoleon was pondering, definite intelligence was brought to Wellington, who, learning for certain that Blucher was at Wavre, promised to stand fast himself at Mont Saint Jean and fight, if Blucher would support him with two corps. The intrepid marshal replied that he would come with his whole army, and Wellington got the famous answer before night thus was made between generals who thoroughly trusted each other that combination which led to the battle of waterloo it was no chance combat but the result of a deliberate design rendered capable of execution even when blucher was wounded by his resolve to retreat upon wavre and by napoleon who acted on conjecture that the prussians would hurry toward their base at liege the morning at quatre bras was peaceful the allies cooked their food before starting forward wellington it is said lay down for a moment and snatched perhaps a little sleep there was no stir in front or on the exposed left flank and covered by a strong display of horsemen the allied divisions tramped steadily toward mont saint jean napoleon had hesitated long before he took any decision and when about midday ney's horsemen showed on the highway and napoleon's leading squadrons were approaching from ligny there was no force near quatre bras except cavalry the duke was still to the fore as the french came on the heavy and light brigades retired over the deal by fords or through the defile of genappe the french horse followed and beyond genappe essayed a charge at first with some success but soon they were overborne by the first life guards and then held aloof so the retreat continued all day a thunderstorm so often a precursor of wellington's battles deluged the fields with rain and pursuer and pursued 
struggling through the mire were drenched to the skin by nightfall napoleon was with the light horse in advance when they halted at la belle alliance and fired a few guns which were answered from the opposite ridge derlon lobo and the guard had come up but Ray was still at Genappe and did not rejoin until the next morning End of section thirteen Section fourteen of Wellington by George Hooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter nine. Waterloo. Part two. The results of two days' warfare may be thus summed up. Napoleon had inflicted a defeat, yet not a decisive defeat, upon the Prussians, who escaped from his ken to Havre he had then at a late hour on the seventeenth detached grouchy with thirty-three thousand men to follow them and grouchy at night from jean Bleu, reported that they had retired in three directions moving himself in the afternoon napoleon uniting with ney had pursued wellington to mont saint jean and slept in the comfortable belief that he had separated the allies at that very time wellington who had assembled his whole force except seventeen thousand men including the british brigades who were posted at halle and toubise was in close communication with blucher and intended on the eighteenth to stop napoleon by delivering battle and to hold him fast until blucher could cut in on his right flank and rear thus it was the allies who were united practically and the French army, which was separated into two groups, unable to support each other. Considering that in the estimation of a modern school of English military critics, Wellington and Blücher were second- or third-rate generals, and that the former roughly pitched his estimate of Napoleon's presence at 40,000 men, the facts on the evening of the 17th tell rather in favor of second-rate generalship. But the truth is, that the military critics, after years of investigation and deep study, possess a knowledge not vouchsafed to either Napoleon or Wellington, and its fruit is the kind of judgment, après coup, which is supposed to be so instructive and is often so unjust. What would Napoleon or Wellington or both not have given for one tithe of the exact information which enables criticism to make use of the advantage which its enlarged horizon affords? that is, to judge the generals by a series of facts and results which were not and could not have been known to them at the time. The tempest which burst over the retreating columns on the 17th followed them to their bivouacs and raged all night, and did not cease until late on the fateful Sunday. Wellington, mounting his faithful Copenhagen at break of day, rode from the village of Waterloo to the field, where the armies on both sides protected by watchful sentries, were still contending with the mischiefs inflicted by the storm. The position was the crest of a gentle slope, stretching from Smoin to the Nivelle Road, having upon and in advance of its right the chateau, garden, and wood of Hougomont, and in the centre, where the Charlevoix Road cut through the little ridge, the farm of La Haye Sainte. Both these posts were occupied, but the latter, unfortunately, not so solidly as Hougomont. The greater portion of the Allied army forming the right and centre was on the west, and the left along the Wave Cross Road on the eastern side of the highway. Behind Hougomont, the ground trended back toward braine la loue and Meurgren, and here the reserves were posted. It was indeed, combined with Hougomont, the storehouse and strength of battle. The front, about two miles long, was held by infantry and guns. The cavalry, except two light brigades on the extreme left, were in rear on the gentle northern slope, and invisible from the French position. Behind all were the Dutch-Belgian cavalry, the Brunswickers, and after the action had begun, Lambert's British brigade from Ghent. The position was well filled by the 69,000 men of all arms and 156 guns which were present that day. Napoleon, who slept at the farm of Caillou and who had been out on foot to the front during the night, was also early in the field and glad of the gift which he thought fortune had placed in his hands. 
when Rey had joined him from Genap, he had seventy-two thousand men, all admirable soldiers, and two hundred and forty guns, with which to engage in combat, and he reckoned that the chances were ninety to ten in his favour. He mounted his charger, reconnoitred his opponent's position, and then gave the orders which promptly and finally obeyed, disclosed the French array. There were two lines of infantry, two of heavy cavalry, backed by a reserve of both arms, and finally the imposing masses of the imperial guard. The front stretched from Frichermont across the Charleroi to the Nivelle Road, and one may imagine with what admiration and interest Wellington and his officers watched the formation of that grand example of order and power, and listened to the outcries which greeted the emperor when he rode along his majestic lines. It was now nearly eleven o'clock, and although his opponent knew it not, Wellington had got news of the march from Wavre of Bulot, whose leading troops were actually at that time close to the wood of Saint Lambert on the French right, while Grouchy was at Sar les Wallins between Jean Blou and Wavre. It is not practicable here to give a full account of the Battle of Waterloo. We can only describe its broad outlines. The first gun was fired about twenty or thirty minutes past eleven, and preluded a dashing and sustained attack on Hougemont, which failed to carry the house, garden, or orchard, but did gain the wood. It was probably intended to divert attention from the attack on the left and centre, which Ney, massing his guns opposite the British left, was preparing to execute. Wellington watched and in some measure controlled the fight for Hougemont, and then rode off to the centre, taking post at a solitary tree which grew near the Charlevoix road above la haye sainte nay at half-past one sent forward the whole of derlon's corps and although some of them pushed up close to and over the wavre road stormed the orchard of la haye sainte and took the Poplot farm yet at the critical moment sir william ponsonby's union brigade of horse charged into the french infantry already shattered by the fire of picton's troops and the net result of the combined operation was that two eagles and three thousand prisoners were captured while nearly all that number of killed and wounded remained on the ground on the other side of la Sainte, the household brigade led by lord anglesey in person charged in upon and routed a large body of french cuirassiers the grand attack thus completely failed and the centre like the right remained intact it was just before this combat began that napoleon saw something like troops toward st lambert and dispatched two brigades of light cavalry to reconnoitre a prussian staff officer was caught beyond planchenois and from him came the unexpected and unwelcome information that the whole prussian army was approaching and after the defeat of Derlon, napoleon detached lobo's troops to cover his right the imperial guard moving up from rossum to take his place so that the two heavy blows came almost together and the force pressing on wellington was reduced by more than ten thousand men the first fruit of the steady prussian advance the signs of danger on his right flank the punishment of derlon's corps the ineffectual attempt upon the british guards in and about hougemont were followed by a kind of pause and the combat reverted to cannonading and skirmishing but toward four o'clock napoleon increasing the fire of his artillery threw forward a mass of cavalry forty squadrons and then began that series of reiterated onsets of horse which lasted for two hours their advent was foreseen and the infantry west of the charleroi road went at once into squares and oblongs a form devised by major afterwards sir james shaw kennedy so that the horse which rode through the batteries in the crest wasted themselves in vain against the intrepid infantry twice they were driven down the slope and the third time when they came on they were strengthened by kellermann and guillot until they reached a force of seventy-seven squadrons or twelve thousand men but these also were repulsed the british horse what remained of them charging when the french were entangled among the squares and disordered by the musketry and guns four times these fine troopers charged yet utterly failed to penetrate or move a single foot battalion <laughs> 
but some time before the final effort ney by a fierce attack got possession of les saintes and thus just as the cavalry were exhausted the french infantry were established within sixty yards of the allied centre and although the emperor was obliged to detach one half of his guard to the right because blucher had brought into play beyond planchenois against lobo nearly thirty thousand men still the capture of la Sainte was justly regarded as a grave event wellington during the cavalry fight had moved three brigades on his right nearer to hougomont and had called up chasse and his belgians to support them and it was a little before this time that he cried out to brigadier-general adam by god adam i think we shall beat them yet a little later shaw kennedy in some trepidation rode up to the duke to report that the centre of the line was open for the hanoverians had been wasted away by the ceaseless fire this very startling information he received with a degree of coolness and replied to with such precision and energy as to prove the most complete self-possession he said to kennedy i shall order the brunswick troops to the spot and other troops besides go you and get all the german troops of the division to the spot that you can and all the guns that you can find the duke himself led forward the brunswickers the hanoverians and nassauers rallied vivian's cavalry rode up from the left where Zieten's advance was in sight the danger passed away and wellington rode back to the rear of the foot guards the crisis of the battle had come for napoleon unable after eight hours conflict to do more than capture la haye sainte hardly pressed by the prussians now strong and aggressive owing such success as he had obtained to the valour and discipline of his soldiers the emperor delivered his last stroke not for victory he could no longer hope to win but for safety he sent forward the last ten battalions of his guard to assail the british right and directed the whole remaining infantry force available to attack all along the line the guard marched onward in two columns which came successively in contact with their opponents napier's guns and the british guards who rising from the ground showed across the head of the first column fired heavily and charging drove them in confusion back toward la belle alliance and the second column struck in flank by the musketry of the fifty second and ninety fifth were next broken by a bayonet charge and pursued by colonel colburn to and beyond the charleroi road as Zieten's prussians were falling upon the french near papelotte and pire and bulot wrestling with the imperial guard in planchenois wellington ordered the whole of the british line to advance the cheers arising on the right where he was extended along the front and gave new strength to the wearied soldiers he led the way as he neared the charleroi road the riflemen full of peninsular memories began to cheer him as he galloped up but he called out no cheering my lads forward and complete your victory he found that good soldier colburn halted for a moment before three squares of the rallied imperial guard go on colburn he said better attack them they won't stand nor did they wellington then turned to the right where vivian's light cavalry were active in the gloom and we next find him once more with the fifty-second near rossomme the farthest point of the advance where that regiment halted after its grand march over the battlefield somewhere on the highway he met blucher who had so nobly kept his word and it was then that gneisen now undertook to chase the fugitives over the frontier the french or perhaps we should say the napoleonic army was destroyed and the power which its mighty leader had built up on the basis of its astonishing successes was gone for ever wellington returned to the village of waterloo that night and as he dismounted after having been so many hours in the saddle his trusty copenhagen still fresh gave a playful kick remembered by his master in after years how he felt after his well-won triumph has been often recorded the man who has been lightly accused of having a cold heart wept bitterly when the strain of duty was relaxed and he saw the list of killed and wounded what can better illustrate the iciness of his nature than the expressive saying drawn from him by waterloo that nothing is worse than a victory except a defeat 
or the manly pathos of his letters to the relatives of his dead friends but there was nothing of the actor about him and that defect if it be one is mistaken for cold insensibility by the lovers of the theatrical element in daily life as well as in war dr holm found him in bed early on the morning of the nineteenth he had as usual taken off his clothes but had not washed himself as i entered he sat up in bed his face covered with the dust and sweat of the previous day and extended his hand to me which i took and held in mine whilst i told him of gordon's death and of such of the casualties as had come to my knowledge he was much affected i felt the tears dropping fast upon my hand and looking toward him saw them chasing one another in furrows over his dusty cheeks that is a picture of private life and it is not the only example of wellington's genuine tenderness of heart exhibited in the quiet days of peace as well as on the morrow of a tragic victory what was his share in the supreme triumph achieved on the eighteenth of june eighteen fifteen after years of eager investigation it has been discovered that he should have fortified and garrisoned the farm buildings of la haye sainte with more care and that he should have summoned colville's two british brigades from Hall. these were the two heinous faults which minish his renown although committing them he still won the day next it is said not however by the same order of minds that he owed his success to the prussians certainly just as the prussians owed their success to the british the latter had been fighting stiffly for five hours before a prussian shot was fired and they fought on for nine hours but that was the bargain wellington was to run the great hazards of a battle long enough to bring the prussians into action and he redeemed his pledged word not less assuredly than blucher a worthy comrade redeemed his not merely by fighting which came later but by pushing forward bulow's leading troops which compelled napoleon to detach lobo as early as two o'clock the full stress of the prussian battle was not developed until six o'clock and even then the defeat of the imperial guard preceded the capture of planchenois but why dispute over shares of glory when there is so much for all it is not necessary to follow the allied armies in their march on paris and it may be sufficient to say that on july third fifteen days after the rout of waterloo hostility ceased paris capitulated the french army retired beyond the loire and on the eighth the bourbon king entered the capital of france wellington had done all he could to restrain the anger of blucher who wished to hang napoleon if he caught him and blow up the bridge of jena the emperor fled to rochefort and the bellerophon escaping from blucher to the perpetual exile of st helena and wellington rescued the bridge from destruction by reason and good management to his great influence also france was indebted for the slight territorial changes made in her frontier practically his active military life ended on july third eighteen fifteen but he sojourned in france three years longer in command of the army of occupation during that period he was requested to adjust and did adjust the many grave questions arising out of claims on france and counterclaims by the french he reduced the amount against her by nearly one-fourth and finally although adverse to his own personal interests he persuaded the allied sovereigns to terminate the occupation which by treaty might have continued for some years he never afterwards commanded an army in the field his career as a man of action was over and now we may glance back on that career and ask whether it is or is not the career of a great captain the question is not so foolish as it looks because high authority has recently denied him a place in the foremost rank of commanders lord wolseley has declared that wellington cannot be placed in the first line of generals because he did not secure or even try to secure the affection of his soldiers certainly that never was the motive of his conduct he had a totally different idea of the duty alike of citizen and soldier that idea he always tried his utmost to realize and it was not to make himself beloved but to perform his task faithfully and if possible which was not easy make others perform theirs but if he was not adored like napoleon he was loved by the men he led so well for if not 
why did napier print that truthful and touching dedication which stands on the first page of his immortal book this history he wrote i dedicate to your grace because i have served long enough under your command to know why the soldiers of the tenth legion were attached to caesar no troops ever followed any general with more alacrity stood fast with more unconquerable determination or at his word started joyously forward into more deadly perils than the british and even the portuguese soldiers of wellington's armies lord wolseley also asserts that if napoleon had been the man he was at austerlitz he would have won the battle of waterloo it is a pure hypothesis and about as reasonable as one which might be framed thus if soult or clausel instead of araby had commanded the egyptian army in eighteen eighty two sir garnet wolseley would not have won the battle of tel el kabir what is the value of criticism which alters all the conditions on one side and does not venture to alter them on the other napoleon and wellington and blucher fought out their fight in the circumstances existing between the fourteenth and nineteenth of june we can only judge them by the light of those circumstances all else is pure fantasy and if the greatest general is he who makes the fewest mistakes and does not wage war on conjectural grounds then wellington was the greater on the fields of belgium for incontestably he made fewer mistakes and acted on fewer and less dangerous conjectures than his mighty antagonist it is an idle controversy the intellectual greatness of napoleon is as manifest as his selfishness and freedom from the fetters of moral principle but it was the radical vices of his nature which rendered his vast we might say supreme intellect of no avail and sent him to finish his turbulent life in the dreariness of exile that form of intellectual activity which is called military genius is when free from the restraints of all moral principle a curse to mankind and that will be an ill day for england when her generals come to prefer and adore such a form for it makes the soldier of genius master of the state for personal objects instead of being what he should be the servant alike of the state and of the loftiest idea of duty wellington throughout his life used his abilities call them talents or genius not to magnify himself but to serve his country according to his lights if he is not entitled to rank with the foremost to be not the greatest but among the few great captains it would be interesting to know in what military greatness consists he succeeded in all he undertook his indian career alone presents a model of what a soldier should be and should have exempted him from the foolish charge of being timid and overcautious wanting in vigour and decision we may be allowed to measure a man's genius if that is the correct word by the relations which his means bear to the ends he attains except frederick the second and bonaparte in italy no generals in modern times have performed so much as wellington with such scanty and uncertain resources we have also to remember his boundless confidence his inexhaustible patience in gloom as well as sunshine and imagine if we can the kind of courage it required to face and overcome the endless obstacles raised by the british portuguese and spanish governments if we adopt for once the practice of indulging in suppositions let us ask what might not wellington have been able to accomplish had he possessed like napoleon absolute command over the wealth and manhood of england spain and portugal instead of being obliged to beg for a small army of britons deal as best he could with the regency at lisbon and the cortes at seville or cadiz and perform in turn all parts civil as well as military which the exigencies of the movement or the paucity of competent men demanded from day to day quite apart from the crowning event of waterloo there is ample room in the indian and peninsular campaigns of wellington to give him a place among the foremost warriors with a little army says charat he did great things and that army was his work he should remain and he will remain one of the grandest military figures of this century it is a just verdict and we heartily trust that regardless of party and faction and self-interest england's generals and for reasons as valid whether they be styled men of genius or men of talent will always deserve to be ranked with wellington as the servants of duty and their country.
End of section 14.